Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome to the most anticipated session of the uh, Shogat Khanam Cancer Symposium, uh, the Essen Rashid Memorial Medal session. And um, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, welcome you all. Uh, we are going to have uh, seven presentations today for this uh, session. And then uh, while uh, we wait for the judges to score them, we'll have some more uh, awards to give away. So a bit about uh, the Essen Rashid uh, uh, session and uh, how did it all started. So I'll give you a brief history of uh, uh, the actual uh, um, session when it was introduced in 2017. And this was done in memory of uh, Mr. Essen Rashid. He was a great supporter and benefactor of Shaukat Khanam Memorial Trust. He was a member of our board of governors in the very early days of the Shaukat Khanam Cancer Hospital. He was a close personal friend of Mr. Imran Khan in both philanthropy and as well as later he helped him in politics as well. He was a very popular figure among Pakistani expatriates in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and was very well known for his compassion and generosity. Sadly, he succumbed to cancer himself towards the end of 2016. And since then, in 2017, we introduced this session in his memory, uh, being a great supporter of Shaukat Khanna Memorial Trust. And this uh, session is actually, uh, what it does is it gives, um, uh, medal to the best presenter for the highest ranked research in the form of free paper. Uh, I would also like to welcome uh, Mr. Mansoor, who's uh, um, son of uh, Mr. Essen Rashid, and uh, it's uh, our pleasure to welcome him. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce the judges. Uh, I would first like to request Dr. Oriol Paris, who's a consultant radiation oncologist at Champolimar Foundation in Lisbon, Portugal. So if I could request uh, Dr. Paris to please come on the stage. Thank you, please. Next, I would request uh, Professor Yasik Gronwald, uh, who is a professor of genetics and pathology at uh, Pomeranian Medical University, Sieschen, Poland. And last but not the least, our very own Dr. Arif Jamshed, who is a senior consultant radiation oncologist at Shavat Hanum Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Lahore. All right. so. Um, just to uh, let the presenters know that uh, this will be a total of 10 minutes for each presentation, eight minutes for the presentation and two minutes for the question. Please be very mindful of the fact that the time is to be strictly followed and uh, that would actually go towards uh, the actual judgment as well. So uh, the first presentation that we're gonna start with is by Dr. Asad Masood who's a trainee in anesthesia at Shaukat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Lahore. And he will be talking about comparison of the efficacy of celiac plexus neurolysis versus celiac plexus neurolysis plus radiofrequency ablation for cancer-associated upper abdominal pain. So Dr. Asad Masood. The best of the people are those that bring most benefit to the rest of mankind. This thing has been a great source of inspiration for me. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Asad Masood, working in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. I'll be discussing about a comparison today. A comparison 
between celiac plexus neurolysis versus combination of celiac plexus neurolysis and radiofrequency ablation for cancer-associated abdominal pain. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Before starting off with the discussion of my study, let's have a look at the magnitude of the problem. If you look at the worldwide incidence, upper GI cancers comprise of 26.3% of all the cancers diagnosed per year, with a mortality rate of 36.4%. If you look at Pakistan, in the year 2021, upper GI cancers comprised of 7.7% of all the cancers diagnosed in that year. Almost similar results were reciprocable in Shokat Khanam as well. What can we offer these patients in terms of management? If they are diagnosed at an early stage, we can offer them treatment in the form of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgical resection with a curative intent. Those patients that are diagnosed at a later stage, we can offer them treatment in the form of palliative care, in which physical, psychological, and socioeconomic components are addressed. Furthermore, recent studies have shown that 50% of all the upper GI cancers are irresectable at the time of diagnosis. And 50% of these patients have got severe, intractable abdominal pain. Why pain management is so important? Why pain is considered so painful? Ladies and gentlemen, there can be only one explanation for this, good quality of life because those patients that have got pain have a very poor quality of life. They have shown increased incidence in anxiety, depression, sleep deprivation, and they are unable to carry the daily activities of their life, hence drastically affecting their psychosocial health. For such pain, we can offer them non-pharmacological management like psychotherapy, pharmacological like acetaminophen, NSAIDs, weaker and stronger opioids, or in certain specialized centers like ours, we can offer them pain interventions. Let's have a look at the WHO analgesic letter. We are all quite familiar with it. I would like to focus on step three. For moderate to severe pain, a multimodal management has been advised. Why this multimodal management? In order to avoid the undesirable side effects, for example, if we talk about opioids, dependence, tolerance, constipation, respiratory depression, Patients have shown decreased compliance to such medications. And also, we are an opioid poor country, as depicted by this graph. We have got a problem with the supply chain and demand of the drug. Hence, we have to rely more on the non opioids and interventions. Coming to main slide pain intervention. Celiac plexus is a plexus of nerves that is situated in front of the aorta at the level of T12 and 1 vertebra. In neurolysis, we use a chemical neutralizing agent like alcohol and phenol and cause blockage of pain transmission from the celiac plexus to the central nervous system. Another technique by the name of radiofrequency ablation or splanking nerves has been in, in the system in which instead of causing a blockage of celiac plexus, we cause ablation or splanking nerves with the help of an alternating current. So the main objective of my study was adequate pain relief, reduction in analgesic requirement, and overall patient satisfaction. It was a prospective, single-blinded, randomized controlled trial. So patients 18 years and above coming in with pain associated with upper abdominal malignancies were included. Patient with ASA 4 or above were excluded, and so were the patients with history of failure to the same procedures, and currently on anticoagulants were excluded. 44 patients were selected after informed consent, they were randomized into two groups. Group A received celiac plexus neurolysis only, while group B received celiac plexus neurolysis and radiofrequency ablation. Following four parameters were assessed. Pain score after one week and four weeks, analgesic requirement using equivalent doses of oral morphine in milligrams, and patient satisfaction. For continuous variables, mean and median was used. For categorical variables, frequency and percentages was used. Chi-SK test was used to determine a p-value, and a p-value less than 0 0.05 was considered significant. Moving on to results, 57% patients were male as compared to 43% which were female. The mean age of presentation was 58. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the main slide. I would like you all to focus on it. The mean pain score at presentation was similar in both the groups. The mean pain score after one week of the intervention 
in the block only group came down to 4.40 and in the block with ablation group it came down to 2.05 the difference was statistically significant the difference remained significant in the fourth week after the intervention as well with a pain score of 4.93 in this block only group and 2.12 in the block and ablation group talking about reduction in opioid consumption if you look at the block and ablation group a cumulative opioid reduction of 58.9% was seen as compared to 23.8% in the block only group which is again statistically significant two patients in each group suffered from self limiting complications and no intervention was done we had certain limitations to our study it was a single blinded single centered and we had a small sample size as this was a pioneer study so results were not comparable was the combination of procedure we offered cost effective yes if we have a look at the patient's perspective there was decreased number of hospital visits after the procedure and less traveling expenses they had decreased dependency on the medications hence less buying of those medications and overall they stated to have a good quality of life if you have a look at the hospital's perspective there was decreased patient burden in the pain opd decreased admission of patients due to pain crisis and there was decreased burden on the pharmacy in dispensing the medications and as we have told before we are we are an opioid poor country we were able to conserve the opioids by reducing their consumption hence my conclusion silic plexus neurolysis with radio frequency ablation of smacking nerves has far superior pain control in managing such intractable pain along with reduction in opioid consumption and related side effects resulting in overall improvement in patient's quality of life hence my, thank you so much Any questions? We have two minutes for questions, please. I can ask a question. Uh, I'm Halima Said, one of the pediatric oncologists here. I just wanted to know how you assessed quality of life. You said there was improvement of quality of life. Uh, which score did you use, or which uh, questionnaire? Okay, so uh, we didn't use any questionnaire. We used two questions: yes or no. Was the patient uh, uh, satisfied with the procedure that we offered? And uh, in the block combination of block, patient eighty-one percent of the patients showed that yes, they were satisfied after the block. and as i've told before that if we look at the cost effectiveness there was decreased hospital visits there was decreased uh, patient dependency on the medications so overall that translates into a good quality of life with the patient stated when we asked them yes or no but we didn't use any question in question in both groups uh, amount of whom uh, number of men and women was the same uh no we used a computer generated randomizer Yeah. So uh, it randomly divided the group into two groups, uh -huh. but overall there was fifty-seven percent male and forty-three yeah. percent patient. Female. And and did you see any differences between tolerance for pain between women and men? Ah, uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, very nice uh, presentation, Asad. Asad, you mentioned you got uh, these forty-four patients and all had these uh, malignancies. Uh, Were they mostly pancreatic cancer, or what was the distribution of cancers among those four? Uh, so, uh, what we included in our study was a combination of GI cancers that uh, that comprise of uh, pancreatic cancer, that comprise of pituitary cancers, and the uh, gastric cancers as well. So, almost equivalent proportions were there. But and yeah, the uh, the main proportion of the patients was uh, having pancreatic cancer. The bulk was pancreatic cancer. Yes. Uh, both the procedures, either the silic plexus or the or the RFA, they have independently decreased the pain in such patients. No, no, that you have shown. But what if one arm you only give RFA, and mm -hmm. you know may, it may be the results are confounding because it might be the results of the RFA. No, that you have shown. Ah, uh, no, yeah. So uh, there was. If we review the literature uh, in the RFA, there wasn't that much decrease. It was almost equivalent with the silic plexus. But in combination, once we combine it with silic plexus and RFA, there was much improvement in the pain relief. Okay. 
But yeah, if you have a look at the literature, almost there was equivalent reduction in pain in both the procedures. But the combined, they have gotten an effect. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asit. Uh, so we will now move on to our next talk. That is by Dr. Afshin Raza. She will be doing an online presentation. She's from National Center for Cancer Care and Research in Doha, Qatar. And her talk is going to be on serum biomarkers as predictors of treatment response in non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with immunotherapy. So Dr. Afshin Raza, if we have her online. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Afshin, we can hear you. You can go ahead with your presentation. I can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today I will be talking about serum biomarkers as predictors of response in non small cell lung cancer patients treated with immunotherapy. So basically, uh, uh, the immune checkpoints are co-stimulatory or inhibitory receptors that are present on the T cells. And when they bind to their ligands on the dendritic cell or the macrophages, it leads either to T cell activation or T cell suppression. Now the tumor cells, they utilize this immune checkpoint pathway to uh, express uh, certain immune suppressive ligands such as PDL1, which bind to the receptors on the T cell known as PD1. And as a result of which there is immune suppression and tumor immune escape. So the checkpoint, uh, to counter this immune checkpoint inhibitory uh, uh, inhibitors are, uh, are generated that are monoclonal antibodies that bind to PD-1 or PDL one receptors and ligands, and as a result of which block the interaction between the receptor and the ligand. This leads to increased anti-tumor response and decrease in the immune tumor immune scale. A number of FDA-approved immune checkpoint inhibitors are uh, are in practice, but the response rates are very low, approximately 20 to 40 percent. And there are a number of factors that may be associated with this, which include, uh, for example, as we talked about the expression of PDL1 by the tumor cells to suppress the immune response. In addition to this, there are other factors that may be released into the tumor microenvironment leading to immune suppressive uh, tumor microenvironment. So we wanted to look, determine the expression of pretreatment soluble biomarkers as predictors of response in non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1. We looked at the potential expression of immune oncology and circulating tumor biomarkers in responders and non-responders and associated it with treatments and progression-free survival in patients. So serum samples so from 31 advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer patients was taken was before treatment. That was anti-PD-1, anti-PD-1, anti or combined chemoimmunotherapy. Immune oncology multiplexing kits, which target the T-cell exhaustion or stimulation markers, NK-cell or circulating tumor circulate markers were markers utilized were to assess the concentration of serum biomarkers and then associated with treatment response. As we took the before treatment samples, the treatment response of patients was assessed via imaging or clinical summary. We, we used the Illuminex BioRad uh, Bioplex 200 system to test uh, 37 immune oncology immune analytes, on which are shown here, shown here, and circulating and cancer biomarkers bio such as CA125, CA15 by 3, CA19 by 9, CEA, and CYFRA21. So what we saw was when we compared the soluble biomarkers between responders and non-responders in anti-PD-1, anti-PDL1 monotherapy treated, we were able to see that in responders, there was a significant down-regulation of immune inhibitory markers, PDL2, CD80, 
TIM3 and NICTIM2, indicating that these could be specific biomarkers for patients that are treated with anti pd one or anti pd one monotherapy. Uh, I would like to clarify that we did compare the sorbitol biomarkers between responders and non-responders in the chemo immunotherapy group as well, but we did not find any significant up or down regulation in that group. We then correlated, compared the co soluble biomarkers between responders and non-responders, irrespective of the treatment type, which means that patients on all types of treatments, all responders, all non-responders were uh, compared between each other. And we were able to see that there was a significant down regulation of immune inhibitor biomarkers CD80, TIMD4, and CEA, indicating that these could serve as generalized biomarkers of immune modulation and treatment response in immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment therapy in non small cell lung cancer patients. Now we found the concentration, but we wanted to look at the optimal cutoff values of these soluble molecules, as it's known that for any biomarker to go into a diagnostic setting, an optimal cutoff is needed. So we did, so we did the receiver operating curve analysis, and we were able to see that a cutoff value of CD80 less than 91.7 pico, picogram per ml. MD4 less than 600 picogram per ml and CEA less than 1614 picogram per ml was uh, able to discriminate responders from non-responders with the sensitivity ranging from 70 to 80 percent. We then wanted to associate the higher than cutoff and lower than cutoff values of these soluble markers with progression-free survival in patients. And for this, we did the Kaplan-Meier curve, and we were able to see a better progression-free survival in patients with CD80 less than 91.7 picogram per ml, and CEA less than 1614 picogram per ml. However, no significant association of TIMD4 was associated with progression-free survival. This is just a summary of so all the biomarkers that were found to be down-regulated in responders. And as you can see, all of them are immune inhibitory markers that correlates well with the clinical picture of the patient. In conclusion, we would like to say that significant down-regulation of immune inhibitory markers, PDL2, CD80, TIM3, and Nectin2 in responding patients can serve as discriminatory or predictive markers in anti-PD1, anti-PDL1 treated patients. A comparison of soluble markers, irrespective of treatment types of finding generalized biomarkers, uh, include significant downregulation of immune inhibitory markers, CD80, CEA, and TIMD4 in responders. And when you associate these serum biomarkers with progression-free survival, a cutoff value of CD80 less than 91.7 and CEA less than 1614 is significantly associated with progression-free survival. Uh, in summary, I would like to say that uh, blood-based biomarkers in serum or plasma can have utility in longitudinal monitoring in ICI treatment, and they can be used as predictive biomarkers of response, not only in immunotherapy, but all types of therapies and cancers. Uh, in the end, I would like to uh, uh, quote one of the quotation from Professor James P. Allison, who is the Nobel uh, Prize laureate for immunotherapy. And as he says, the biggest challenge in immunotherapy now is figuring out why an immune drug works in some patients and not in others. And to do that, we need to go back to basic sciences. And I believe the biggest challenge is not only in immunotherapy, but this is for all types of cancer therapies. And we need to find predictive and prognostic biomarkers. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm ready to take the questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abshin. Uh, we are open to questions. We have two minutes for questions. There are any, please. Okay, it seems there are no questions. So thank you, Dr. Afshin. Uh, I would so request, uh, we'll let you know if when the results are announced and you will um, get the intimation via email. So thank, thank you very you. much for thank your you so much. presentation thank and joining you. from Qatar. Okay. Okay, so the next talk uh, will be by Dr. Sundas Bilal.
She's a fellow in gastroenterology department of internal medicine at Shagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Lahore. Uh, she will be talking about risk of tumor seeding in percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy in aerodigestive tumors, a single center experience. Dr. Sundas, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Sundas Bilal, working as a gastroenterology fellow. Uh, today, I am going to share our experience on the risk of tumor seeding following percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy in aerodigestive tumors. So, PIG tube was first described by the gardener in 18. The main indications were the stenosing tumor, cancer treatment related adverse effects, and the neurological causes leading to dysphagia and malnutrition. So there are two types of pegs we normally place. One is a, by a push method. It's we directly push the peg tube into the stomach and the other one is a pull method. And we actually place the tube or pull it down from the mouth into the stomach. These are the endoscopic images of the pull and push methods. So these techniques are associated with certain advantages and disadvantages uh, in itself. The pull technique is associated with more advantage as compared to the push technique. In the pull technique, there is a single procedure. So it, it uh, decreases the overall uh, cost of the procedure. It is associated with less bleeding risk or complications. No gastropexy is required uh, in contrast to a push technique in which the interior abdominal wall is actually stitched with the stomach in order to prevent the dislodgement of the tubes. Uh, we can also use a homemade uh, economical feeds through a pull technique peg tube in, uh, as compared to a push technique peg tubes, which require expensive feed. But one thing uh, concerning here is there is a risk of peg side metastasis with the peg tube. And when we compared it with the pull technique, with the push technique, the risk of uh, Pull technique has um, more um, pegside metastasis, which is 0.56 as compared to pull technique, 0.25%. In addition to this risk factor, the other risk factor of pegside metastasis are advanced stage of tumor, older age, male, gender, squamous cell carcinoma, and the poor differentiation of the tumor. So based on this, the European Society of Gastrointestinal uh, Endoscopy actually says uh, suggested to prefer the push technique in both head and neck cancers and esophageal cancers. This was based on a meta-analysis of case reports and case series, and thus this was a weak recommendation with a low quality evidence. It is also suggested that we should place a peg tube in esophageal cancers only if they have a dysphagia score uh, higher than two. So what we were doing, we are placing peg tubes via pull method in all our head and neck cancers since 2008. And we are also prophylactically placing the peg tubes in our esophageal cancers. So this actually raised certain questions in our mind that do we need to change our practice based on the preferred method suggested by the ESG 2020? And if not, then if is the direct tumor contact with the peg tube really a risk factor for peg tube metastasis? or uh, as we belong from a low middle uh, income country, is cost effectiveness worth the risk of tumor seeding? So in order to answer all these questions, we actually conducted the study with an intention to find out the risk of pegside metastasis in our uh, population, uh, to look for the nutritional benefits, complication and 30 day mortality in our patients. So we included all the patients with the aerodigestive cancers who underwent the treatment with curative intent. We excluded all the patients who had metastatic disease to begin with or those patients who had neurological dysphagia. So pegside metastasis is a macroscopic evidence of a tumor masses on a clinical examination or endoscopy. They usually develop from two weeks to 24 months following a peg tube insertion. The uh, hypothesized mechanism for this is either it is by the direct contact of the neoplastic cell with the 
peg tube or it's a lymphohematogenous spread. So our uh, study is a retrospective cross-sectional study. We conducted it for a duration of 10 years. We collected um, 1,782 patients out of 2769 patients. We followed them up for three years. So coming up to the results, the mean age of our study group was 54 uh, years, almost 60% of the patients were male. Most of the patient had no comorbidities and 12% of patients were smoker. So 50% of patients uh, had esophageal cancers and 50% of patients were head and neck cancers. But the uh, interesting thing is that the 66% of the patient had a direct contact of their tumor with the PEG tube during its placement. So we uh, had almost all the risk factors which are uh, uh, considered to be the risk factors of the PEG side metastasis in our study group, including the advanced stage. So almost 88% of our patients actually presented with a high dyspagia score, which was two and above this. So we calculated the complications and the most interesting thing is this six out of uh, 1,782 patients actually developed the PEG side metastasis, making it one in 300 patients. So out of all these six patients, uh, these were squamous cell carcinoma, these were esophageal cancers. Four out of uh, six of them had distal esophageal cancers. Only two were mid-esophageal cancers. And um, um, two of them had disseminated disease when it was diagnosed to have an apexide metastasis, whereas four of them had an isolated apexide metastasis. The average time of its development in our study was eight months. So the primary outcome was none of our patient had a peptide metastasis in head and neck cancer when it was compared with a published data of 0.25%. And when compared with the pull technique, there was 0.35% as compared to the published literature of 0.56%. So secondary outcome was nutrition. Our, all of our patients actually maintained the nutrition as evident by the stable BMI and delbumin. 30-day mortality was 2% and none of the mortality was uh, due to PEG tube. So our major complications were 1.2% when we compared it with the literature, which varies from 1.5 to 9.4%. So when we uh, actually compared the risk factor for causing these major complications, uh, none of these risk factors were statistically significant in our study group. So our conclusion is the pull technique is not a risk factor for PEG tube insertion in head and neck cancers, but the further studies are required uh, to look uh, the PEG side metastasis in the mid and distal esophageal cancers. And the prophylactic PEG tubes helps in maintaining the nutritional status in patients. The limitation of our study, it's a single center retrospective study. We just used a single method, pull method. Our strength was it was a good number study. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sundas. We have uh, two minutes for questions, if there are any, please. Uh, my question is, why don't we use NG tube instead of PEG tube for, to avoid this PEG site metastasis? Um, in head and neck or in esophageal cancer? Both. In head and neck cancer. Um, for head and neck cancers, normally NG tube is um, um, is uh, actually recommended for those who require the feeding for less than a month. Uh, these patients require feeding to more for a couple of months. So this is one reason. In addition to this, the literature says whenever the NG was used, the quality of life of the patients was not good, and um, uh, they were not able to maintain the their nutrition as well. So it is a preferred to have a PEG tube instead of an NG tube. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, none patient, no patients from head and neck uh, region had uh, PEG side metastasis. So I just wanted to know, uh, you haven't mentioned, I guess, or maybe I missed it. So all the patients of head and neck cancer who had a PEG, were they pre-operatively uh, uh, sent for PEG insertion or post-operatively? Uh -huh. 
not all the patients because we had patients with oropharyngeal hypopharyngeal ca so normally they do not under one surgery um, um, for this they get they definitive chemo xrt so there was a, some small proportion of patients with the tongue or buccal ca patients who actually go underwent the surgery and then came to us for uh, so first the tumor was removed and then the pig was inserted this is the way for uh, almost for almost 3 to 4% out of 16 17% of head and neck cancers yes Thank you. Very nice presentation, Dr. Sundas. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, how did you confirm metastasis at the PEC site? Did you actually biopsy the site? So uh, out of six patients, four of patients had actually a biopsy. Two had a true cut biopsy, two had an FNA. One was diagnosed on the PET CT and one was diagnosed on a simple CT scan. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sundas. Okay, so our uh, next talk will be by uh, Dr. Ibtisam bin Khalid. Uh, he's a surgical oncology uh, trainee from Shavak Khan and Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Lahore. And the topic of the talk is can be reduced by preserving intercostobrachial nerve during axillary lymph node dissection, a randomized control trial, pain trial. Uh, so I'm Dr. Ebtasam. I'm currently working as a second year resident in Department of Surgical Oncology, and I'll be sharing the provisional results of the PAIN trial, and I have no conflict of interest to declare. Right. So as some of you may be aware, that Pakistan has the highest incidence of breast cancer in Asia. A large number of these patients will go on to have axillary lymph nodal dissection. Recent studies such as the Z11 trial, they have demonstrated that ALND can safely be omitted in a certain group of patients. However, in spite of that, ALND still remains an important cornerstone in the management of the breast cancer. Now, I won't be boring the audience with a uh, monotonous lecture on the anatomy of the axilla, but this is essentially how an empty axilla looks like after you're done with the axillary lymph nodal dissection. So this web-like structure that you, can, that you see transversing the axilla, that's actually the intercostobrachial nerve. So ALND, it's not all sunshine and roses. Like any other surgical procedure, it is associated with significant morbidity. Many of these patients, they will go on to develop uh, complications such as surgical site infection, lymphedema, frozen shoulder. And most importantly, about 35% of these patients, they are going to uh, develop chronic post-surgical pain. And these patients will be frequenting breast surgery clinics, uh, pain clinics, and ER with pain of persistent post-surgical pain. Now that subset of patients, it deserves special attention. So uh, can, can we actually uh, decrease chronic pain by preserving the nerve? So unfortunately, there is no consensus at the moment, and the evidence is limited to retrospective studies and four randomized trials. Uh, the problem with these trials is uh, that uh, they have conflicting results, and there are serious methodological limitations. Uh, the largest of these trials enrolled a total of 110 patients. Also, I would like to point out that none of these studies, they evaluated health-related quality of life. Coming over to the pain trial, by design, it is a randomized controlled superiority trial. The protocol was published and registered on the US clinical trials registry with the following uh, trial registration number. Uh, the sample size is 182 patients. The patients underwent preoperative block randomization. The patients were enrolled and randomized a night prior to the surgery. So it is a double-blinded trial with participant and the assessors carrying out the assessments uh, being uh, blinded to the randomization status of the patient. The enrollment commenced on February, 1st of February, 2022, and allocation concealment was ensured using sequentially numbered opaque sealed envelopes. Coming over to the assessments, we did a pre-operative baseline assessment followed by the post-operative assessment at two weeks of follow-up and then at three months of follow-up. So assessment tools for the post-operative pain, we use the pain component of the shoulder pain and disability index SPADI form. For the ipsilateral shoulder disability, we use the disability component of the SPADI form. And for the health-related quality of life, we use the PAC B form. All of these tools, they are linguistically validated for use in our population. And Urdu version of these tools were acquired uh, uh, through the due process. Coming over to the outcomes. The primary outcome of our study is chronic post-surgical pain, and the secondary outcomes are health-related quality of life and functional status of the ipsilateral limb. 
So patients age 18 or above with breast cancer undergoing axillary lymph node and dissection were included. Patients who had redo ALND, who had bilateral ALND, who had history of chronic pain, metastatic disease, and degenerative disease of shoulder were excluded. Right, so I would like to point out to the audience that these results are provisional results. So at the time when we submitted the abstract, we had screened a total of 81 patients, out of which 13 met the exclusion criteria, six patients refused the consent. Subsequently, 62 patients were randomized, uh, 35 in the preserve arm, uh, 27 in the sacrifice arm. There was a crossover of eight patients in the preserve arm and a crossover of one patient in the sacrifice arm. Then the patients underwent surgical intervention after which analysis was carried out, both intention to treat analysis and as treated analysis were carried out as, carried out as I would point out later on. Right, so the, the table shows uh, the comparison of baseline characteristics. Now I want the audience to focus on the first column and on the last column. The first column shows the baseline characteristics, whereas the last column, it shows the p-value. As you can see, none of the p-values are significant, clearly indicating that the two arms of the trial, they are fairly comparable. Right, coming over to the pain, so at two weeks of follow-up, the patients in the preserve arm of the trial, they had a lower mean shoulder pain score as compared to the patients in the sacrifice arm of the trial. At three months of follow-up, and this is important because it actually reflects chronic pain, the patients in the pain in the preserve arm of the trial, they had a lower mean pain score as compared to the patients in the sacrifice arm of the trial. So as far as the health-related quality of life is concerned, at two weeks of follow-up, the patients in the preserve arm of the trial, they had a higher mean quality of life score as compared to the patients in the sacrifice arm. And again, this trend continued at three months of follow-up with the patients in the preserve arm, so having a higher mean quality of life score as compared to their counterparts. So when we did the subgroup analysis, because quality of life is a very complex um, concept, on the subgroup analysis, preserve group had a higher mean score in social, emotional, and functional well-being, and, on, and also on the breast cancer subscales. Right, so now uh, talking about the functional status of the ipsilateral limb. So at two weeks of follow-up, the patients in the preserve arm of a trial, they had a lower mean shoulder disability score as compared to the patients in the sacrifice arm. And at, again, at three months, this trend continued with the patients in the preserve arm having a lower mean shoulder disability score as compared to those in the, in the sacrifice arm. Right. So in our study, the, study the, the surgery duration was prolonged by an average of six minutes in the preserve group, which clearly indicates that nerve preservation can be carried out once you have achieved the learning curve uh, in a timely fashion. So as far as the post-operative complications are concerned, the two groups were comparable, comparable uh, they were comparable, and there was just only one case requiring re-intervention, and that was in the sacrifice arm of the trial. Now, this is an important one, because many of the patients at the time of the enrollment, they raised uh, their concerns with regard to the oncological safety of leaving behind the nerve in the axilla. And as you can see, there is one case of distant metastasis in the preserve group and four cases of distant metastasis in the sacrifice group. Uh, these, uh, these uh, quite, as you can see, uh, the p-value is not significant, clearly which clearly indicates the oncological safety, at least in the short term, of, um, of, the, of the nerve preservation technique. So to conclude, there is a trend which shows lower pain, better health-related quality of life, and better functional status of the ipsilateral limb scores in the preserve group as compared to the sacrifice group. However, at the moment, these results are not statistically significant as the trial is underpowered to draw a definitive conclusion, and that is why the process of enrollment is going on. Uh, the provisional results, however, they do show the oncological safety of the nerve preservation. Coming over to the limitations, it is a single center study, and long-term follow-up is needed to assess the long-term oncological safety of the nerve preservation technique. A few individuals I would like to thank who, uh, who played a very important role in, in this project. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ipsasam. Uh, are there any questions, please? Uh, yes, uh, very nice presentation, Dr. Ipsasam. I just wanted to know that if you uh, considered the form of anesthesia that was given for these patients, like regional blocks or local, because uh, it has been seen in various randomized control trials that regional blocks decrease the uh, incidence of CPSP. So mm -hmm. did you consider this? Right. So uh, a very good question. So first of all, you need to know that CPSP is a very complex entity and there are so many variables involved in it. But one of the beauties of the randomized controlled trial is that once you randomize the patient, these differences, they even out in both arms. 
right? So if, and that is a big if, if you are doing randomization properly, then it doesn't really matter whether they underwent regional blocks or not. These differences, they are going to even out in, even out in both groups. And as you can see, I did a baseline characteristics uh, comparison. Uh, the, uh, the characteristics are fairly comparable in both arms. Uh, but my question is that what if one group received a regional more than the other one? Right, so no, but the, if you are doing randomization properly, then, then that doesn't happen, right? So as long as you're doing randomization properly, then these differences are even out. And so, because otherwise you are going to look into so many variables that, that uh, you know, that would make study um, impossible. Yeah, thank you. I'm having a question. My question is what tool did you use for the evaluation of quality of life? So we use fact B form. The fact what, B form. It's a linguistically validated tool, and Urdu version of the tool is available. And we, uh, we, you know, we we had to get we had to uh, buy it from the copyright holders. Okay, sure. I think MD Anderson holds its copyright. Oh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor Hussain. Okay, we move on to our next talk. That is by Doctor Madia Sayed. She's a fellow in surgical oncology. Department of Pathology at the Shavatam Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Lahore. She would be giving a talk on prognostic significance of minor heart rate component in non-muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma of urinary bladder. Dr. Madhya. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Madiha Sayyid, Fellow Surgical Pathology, and I am here to present my study regarding prognostic significance of minor high grade component in non invasive papillary urothelial carcinomas. Grading of urothelial carcinomas has been a long standing debate ever since. Pure low grade and pure high grade tumors are easy to categorize. The problem arises in cases of tumor heterogeneity when low grade urothelial carcinomas have focal areas of high grade component. This problem has been addressed by World Health Organization. According to WHO 2004 and 16, tumors with minor high-grade component were reported as high-grade regardless of the percentage of high-grade component. According to current WHO 2022, a cutoff of 5% has been introduced. Tumors with less than 5% high-grade component are designated as low-grade with less than 5% high-grade component. And tumors with greater than equal to 5% high-grade component are designated as high-grade. But the data is very limited and WHO recommends further studies to validate this observation. This motivated us to conduct a research to determine prognostic significance of minor high-grade component in non-invasive papillary urothelial carcinomas in comparison with pure low-grade and pure high-grade tumors. We performed a retrospective study of 273 consecutive cases for which follow-up data was available in the hospital archives. Our study included transurethral resections of bladder tumor and non-invasive tumors, PTA only. So this is the exclusion criteria we applied. We stratified our data into four main groups. Group one, pure low grade, group four, pure high grade, and group two and three for the mixed grade tumors. Group two with less than equal to 5% high grade component and group three greater than five, but less than equal to 25% high grade component. Prognosis was determined in terms of recurrence, grade progression, stage progression, metastasis, and death. We assigned tumor grade based on architectural and cytological features. This is low-grade urothelial carcinoma. And if we have a closer look, there is minimal loss of polarity and orderly arrangement of cells. In contrast to the previous picture, this is high-grade urothelial carcinoma with brisk mitotic activity and multiple prominent nucleoli and mark nuclear pleomorphism. So we assigned tumor stage according to the CAP protocol 2021. This is the stage of interest. This is what we call PDA tumor when the tumor is confined to the mucosa, when tumor invades lamina propria, it's T1, and muscle invasive tumors are categorized as T2. So moving on to the results. In terms of tumor recurrence, all four groups showed higher percentage of recurrence regardless of tumor grade. And there is no statistically significant difference between the four groups. In terms of grade progression, group two and three behaved in a similar fashion. And when compared with the group one, they showed higher percentage of grade progression. 
In terms of stage progression, group two and three behaved in a similar fashion, and both groups showed better prognosis than group four and worse prognosis than group one. In terms of metastasis, group two and three showed slight difference from the group one and marked variation compared to group four. Regarding death, worse prognosis is shown by group four, intermediate prognosis by group and three, and best prognosis is shown by group one. So now the survival analysis. In terms of recurrence-free survival, there is no statistically significant difference between the four groups. In terms of grade progression, group one showed better prognosis compared to group two and three. In terms of stage progression-free survival, best prognosis is shown by group one, worse by the group four, and intermediate by the group two and three. In terms of metastasis-free survival, worse prognosis is shown by group four, intermediate by group two and three, and best by the group one. In terms of disease specific survival, worst prognosis is shown by group four, best by group one and intermediate by group two and three. And the p-value also showed statistically significant results. Our study had a total of 31 mixed grade tumors out of which four were treated as low grade and rest of the 27 cases were initially treated as high grade. So main question of our study is regarding the current WHO recommendation that tumors with less than 5% high grade component should be reported and treated as low grade or not. The current WHO recommendation is based on two reference articles. One of them was published in 2014 by Gofrit et al. They used a cutoff of less than 10% to define high grade component and concluded that mixed grade tumors behave in a similar fashion compared to low grade tumors. It is worth mentioning here that tumor grade is of prime significance in non-invasive tumors only, and uh, invasive tumors are treated on the basis of PT stage. So this highlights a major limitation in the study of Goffrey et al. They, their study included both invasive and non-invasive tumor, but the author did not segregate the results on the basis of PTA and PT1. So one cannot draw any conclusion from this study, and that is why we excluded it from our discussion. The other studies by Reese et al. published in 2016, they used a cutoff of less than 5% to define minor high-grade component, and we strictly compared our results with this study. Similar to our results, group one, two, and three showed no difference in tumor recurrence, but when we um, critically analyzed the study of Reese et al., we found that untreated cases of grade two uh, tumors showed way poor prognosis, which is 25% compared to group one, which is just seven. 0.9%. In terms of stage progression and death, it did that mixed grade tumors behave like low grade tumors, which is in contrast to study. It is worth pointing out here that the authors do not claim anywhere that mixed grade tumors should be treated like low grade. Instead, they have suggested that till a larger data is available, mixed grade tumors should be kept as a distinct grade entity. Our study results are supported by a more recent study published in 2021 by the pan at all. They have used a cutoff of less than 25% to define minor high-grade component and concluded that mixed-grade tumors behave better than the high-grade and uh, behave better than low-grade and uh, poor than the high-grade tumors. With this, we conclude our study results. Group 2 showed worse prognosis than group 1. This is in contrast to WHO recommendation that tumors with less than 5% high-grade component behave like low-grade tumors. Group three showed better prognosis compared to group four. And this is again in contrast to WHO recommendation that tumors with greater than or equal to 5% high grade component behave like high grade. So on the basis of our study result, we suggest that diagnose, that reporting and treating the tumors with less than 5% high grade component as low grade is not supported by the uh, data and it will end up in under treatment of patients. With this, I would like to say special thanks to my consultants for their gorgeous help and support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mahia. And uh, uh, the floor is open to questions, please. Um, I want to ask how did you select the cutoffs of less than 5% and 25% in the study? Mm -hmm. And secondly, how did you quantitate the percentage of high grade uh, component? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would answer your question into two halves. In the first half, regarding how we selected the cutoffs, well, it's quite arbitrary based on the currently available data. 
Uh, till date, to the best of my knowledge, three cutoffs have been used by different researchers, less than 5%, less than 10%, and less than 25% to define minor high-grade component. And we selected less than 5% with reference of WHO 2022, and a cutoff of less than 25% with reference of recent study of Kulpan et al. in 20, published in 2021. And moving on to the um, second half of your question, why, how we quantitate the percentage of high-grade component? Well, um, there is no definite method or formula available in the literature to determine the high-grade component and how we did it. We did it like uh, amount of high-grade component uh, present on total uh, area of histological sections. This is how we did it. Hope that answers your question. Good present presentation, Dr. Madhya. I have two questions. First, uh, you mentioned in your study that 27 out of 31 patients were initially diagnosed and treated as high grade. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that it impedes the natural course of disease? And secondly, uh, was there any difference in prognosis when compared with the untreated cases? Well, uh, that's a very good question, I must say. That's what uh, you can call the limitation of the retrospective study design because before the year 2022, all the cases with minor high grade component were diagnosed and treated as high grade. So um, we, uh, I must say that despite the fact that mixed grade tumors were treated as high grade, but they don't behave like low grade tumors anyway. And the um, second component, as you have asked, um, uh, treat untreated and treated cases had any difference in prognosis. So there were only four untreated cases, right? And out of them, two showed disease progression in terms of stage and grade, but there was no metastasis and death. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are out of time for questions. So thank you, Dr. Madhya. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next uh, talk will be by Dr. Uh, Sabah Batul from uh, Department of uh, Pediatric Oncology at Chawad Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Lahore. She would uh, be talking about impact of national collaboration for management and referral of patients with retinoblastoma on presentation and outcome at a tertiary care referral center. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Sana Batul from the Department of Pediatric Oncology. I will be talking about our study regarding the impact of national collaboration and management, a referral of, of the patients with retinoblastoma on presentation and outcome at a tertiary care referral center. Retinoblastoma is the most common eye tumor in children that require multidisciplinary care for optimal outcomes. Outcome in developed countries are excellent with the expected survival of 95%, but the prognosis is poor in developing countries due to the advanced disease at presentation. Retinoblastoma can either present as an intraocular localized disease as is shown in the picture. On the other hand, it can also present with an extraocular advanced disease with or without metastasis associated with poor uh, survival outcomes, which remains the dilemma in the lower middle income countries like Pakistan. The intraocular retinoblastoma is further classified into group A, B, C, D, and E, depending upon the tumor size, its extent, and degree of invasion. The treatment goals are first to save the life of the patient, then save the globe, and finally save the VN. We initiated national collaboration with pediatric oncology and ophthalmology societies of Pakistan to design guidelines to facilitate early detection and management of retinoblastoma patients in 2016. We conducted this study to examine the impact of this nationwide initiated on the presentation and outcome of retinoblastoma in our institution. 
It is a retrospective cohort study. The first cohort designated as cohort one comprised of patients who presented to us from January 2007 to December 2012. After the formulation and induction of the guidelines, the second cohort, which included the patient who presented at our hospital from January 2017 to December 2020, all the patients with retinoblastoma presented during the study period were included in our study. Study variables included demographic data, clinical features, and the outcome. A total of 282 patients were included in this study, out of which 119 patients were included in cohort one and 163 patients were included in cohort two. There was an increase in patient influx from 24 new patients per year in cohort one to 54 new patients per year in cohort two. So there was 44% increase in patient influx after the induction of the guidelines. Abundant rate to the treatment was similar in both of the groups and it was 14%. After the induction of guidelines, the mean age at presentation reduced from 36.8 months to 29.3 uh, months in cohort two. Also, the duration of symptoms was reduced from 7.3 months to a total of 4.5 months respectively after the in, in cohort one and two after the inductions of the guidelines. So patient presented at an earlier age with shorter duration of symptoms. Male to female ratio was almost the same in cohort two while males outnumber female with the ratio of 1.7 into one in cohort one. Before the induction of the guidelines, the rate of enucleation was higher in cohort one, which was 49% in cohort one, and it reduced to 36% in cohort two after the induction of the guidelines. Similarly, most of the patient in cohort two presented with a local disease, intraocular disease in cohort one, 60, 30, in cohort two, 68% of the total patient presented with intraocular disease, while 43.7% of the patient in cohort one presented with intraocular disease with almost similar number of the patient presenting with extraocular disease in cohort one before the induction of the guidelines. At five years, the overall survival was the same. It was about 70% in both of the cohort, which was comparable to the international data available. While for the overall survival for the patient with intraocular disease was uh, reduced from earlier, it was 92% in cohort one to 72% in cohort two. So initiation of national collaboration has resulted in younger age at presentation, earlier diagnosis and referral at lower stage. However, in spite of this, overall survival remain unchanged. It is concerning that the overall survival in intraocular group has decreased. This may be related to an increased attempt to salvage eyes as reflected by the lower number of upfront enucleations done. After development of the National Retinoblastoma Guidelines, Shakakhanam Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center is participating in a prospective study in collaboration with Pakistan Society of Pediatric Oncology titled National Standard of Care Protocol for Treatment and Management of Retinoblastoma. So our study concluded that initiation of national collaboration has led to younger age at presentation earlier referral to the cancer center and localized diseases. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Sitra. Uh, the floor is open to questions, please. The two minutes for questions. Very nice presentation, Dr. Senna. So I just want to ask one question that um, we think that at this time of surgery, most of our patients say abandoned. Uh, but in your study, despite the fact that the mutations were decreased in the later group, uh, the abandonment rate remained the same. Did you look at the causes for this abandonment? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we have actually, we were expecting that because the patient are presenting to us earlier in the 
uh, localized disease. So the overall survival will be improved after the induction of the guideline, but it was not proven by our study. So the, uh, we have looked into the cause and for us, we have been a little conservative for doing the lymph uh, bean salvage we were trying to attempt more and more, we were trying to save more and more eyes. So that is why we have been a little conservative, uh, particularly in patients who are presenting with intraocular group D disease in which we have an option to either give the new adjuvant therapy and then we see that either the tumor is shrink, shrunk and then we can excise the tumor with the local therapy, local treatment. So uh, other option is to enucleate the eye act with upfront enucleation. So maybe we need to be, we are rationalizing our uh, strategies for the globe salvage and that is why we're looking so into I that. I look at the like, causes of uh, abandonment in this probe because like uh, despite the lesser number of surgeries, uh, the patient's abandonment rate was uh, similar in both of So I even to look at it or not. Yes, this is what we wanted to, uh, we will be looking, we will be looking for because uh, the patient abandonment rate was the same and that could be related to the, because once a patient is presented with advanced disease and we are offering the upfront enucleation, then it is acceptable because there is a protruding mass coming out of the eyes and parents as well as the patient are willing for the enucleation. But once a patient is coming from intraocular disease and particularly in group T disease, if enucleation is offered to these patients, then most of the parents deny the treatment and they just leave. So abundant rate remains the same. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sidra. Uh, so we move on to our last talk for the evening. And uh, that is by Dr. Amna Manover. She is a trainee in radiation oncology uh, and clinical and radiation oncology department of uh, Shagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Lahore. She would be giving a talk on dose escalation in preoperative chemoradiation with volumetric modulated art therapy, simultaneous integrated boost in rectal cancer. Dr. Amr. Thank you. Research is to see what everybody else is seeing, but to think what nobody else has thought. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Amna Manavar from the Department of Clinical and Radiation Oncology at Shokat Khanam Lahore. And today I'll be presenting the interim analysis of our phase two perspective trial, dose escalation in locally advanced rectal cancer. Colorectal cancer accounts for about 10% of global cancer incidence and is the second leading cause of cancer related death. The incidence is on a rise and by the year 2040, we are expected to reach 3.2 million. In Pakistan annually, we see around 6,000 new cases of colorectal cancer, uh, which accounts for about 3.6% of the overall tumor burden. Due to a lack of primary healthcare facilities and no screening programs, Unfortunately, more than 80% of these patients present at a locally advanced stage. Uh, and for those patients who have a lower rectal tumor, the surgery of choice is abdominal perineal resection with permanent stoma back formation. Now, permanent colostomy has great implications in terms of quality of life, even in developed world. Uh, the rehabilitation of a permanent stoma uh, colostomy patient is a major undertaking. And in developing country like Pakistan, where there is an absence of primary health care and support, these patients lead a life of untold misery. The standard of care in locally advanced rectal cancer is to offer neoadjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery in the form of total mesorectal excision. New adjuvant chemoradiation helps by downstaging the tumor it has a significant role in improving lower local control as well as in the overall survival. But perhaps the most important role it plays, especially in terms of quality of life of the patient is to improve the chances of sphincter preservation. A pathological complete response is defined as no evidence of any viable tumor in the pathology specimen. And the ECR has strong prognostic and predictive value for local control as well as for survival. In the locally advanced cancer with the conventional doses of radiotherapy, 
we expect to have a 10% rate of pathological complete response. The standard doses of radiation are usually between 45 to 50.4 gray. A recent meta-analysis regarding dose escalation beyond 50 gray showed an improved pathological complete response of around 20% with acceptable toxicity. Uh, rationale for a higher dose is that it will need to an improved pathological complete response, which in turn will lead to a low, improved local control, survival, and sphincter preservation rate. But the million dollar question here is, is it safe to give higher doses? So to answer this question, we designed this trial for dose escalation in locally advanced rectal cancer. We want to assess the acute toxicity of a radiation dose of 53 gray to the tumor bed. So our trial is designed to accrue 60 patients. All of these patients will have a biopsy proven treatment naive and locally advanced rectal cancer. After a completion of their staging workup and informed consent, the patients will receive 53 gray radiotherapy to tumor bed and concurrent chemotherapy in the form of capecitabine. Six weeks after completion of chemo radiation, the patients will have their response assessment scans. So the radiotherapy planning parameters were taken from the RTOG0822 trial, and all of these parameters were well met in all of our patients. Uh, their dose uh, quality assurance check was performed in all of the patients before start of their radiotherapy. And we were able to use newer conformal techniques to deliver a higher dose to the tumor bed at the same time avoiding normal structures like bladder and bowel. In December 2021, one of our patients developed rectal perforation. This as um, a gesture of good clinical practice, we reported to the scientific review committee and decided to undertake this interim analysis. By that time, 16 patients had already been treated. Out of these majority patients, almost 50% of the patients had a T4 disease, two thirds were node positive and 95% of the patients had a threatened circumferential resection margin. Now location wise, 88% of the patients had middle to lower rectal tumor. Now this group of patients is who in future are most likely to require an AP resection with permanent colostomy. Now, uh, after completion of chemo radiation, the median time to surgery in our group of patients was seven weeks. And even though we expected to have 88% patients with AP who might need AP resection, only 50% of the patients required an AP resection. Rest of the 50 uh, received anterior abdominal surgeries. Um, in initial uh, enrollment of our study, there were no T0 or T12 disease tumors. Uh, but and, and they were 44% T4 disease. Um, and after completion of uh, radiation and on surgery specimen, there were no T4 tumors. And the 95% who had a threatened circumferential resection margin, all of the patients received a clear surgery. 93% of our patients showed significant downstaging of their tumor and we were able to achieve the pathological, pathological complete response in 32% of the patients. Now coming to the safety aspect of the trial. So any acute toxicity is any toxicity that develops from the start of a treatment to until six weeks after completion of the treatment. And the only significant grade four toxicity in our patients was the rectal perforation. Now this is the patient, she was a 42 years old female who had a four centimeter long lower rectal tumor. She was clinically staged as T3 and not. This is her staging MR and this is her scan six weeks after completion of chemo radiation. And this shows air in the rectal wall. Upon detailed view of the scan, there was the perforation within the tumor bed and not in the normal bowel surrounding the tumor. After completion of this interim analysis, a few changes were made in our radiotherapy protocol. We reported all of this back to the scientific review committee who reviewed it and have allowed our study to continue. We plan on completing our patient recruitment and presenting the results in a future meeting. So to conclude, this protocol describes a phase two study with dose escalation and is expected to lay foundation for conducting future phase three trials with higher radiation doses and aiming for organ preservation. Thank you.
Okay, questions, please. We have two minutes. Uh, a very nice presentation, Dr. Ramna. I'm Dr. Yasser from Shukat Khanam Peshawar. Uh, you mentioned about uh, threatened CRM in your presentation. Uh, so how do you define CRM threatened and what is its clinical significance? Thank you, Dr. Yasser. So uh, threatened CRM is a tumor present within one millimeter of the section margin, and it has great implications in terms of local control. And uh, this was a stage to in on based on MRI. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Amna, I would like to ask that how exactly did you assess the uh, response to chemo radiation? Uh, the response to chemotherapy, uh, chemo radiation was assessed at six weeks with the MRI pelvis and CT chest and abdomen, and the tumor regression grading was used to assess the response. Okay, thank you. So I'm Dr. Atif from Karachi, the University. Uh, I want to ask that you have mentioned that there are certain changes to the uh, review committee. What were those changes you have recommended? Um, we uh, have um, made the quality assurance check a little more stringent and are planning on um, on uh, couch CT um, evaluation of the assessment of the patient before each pressure. Okay, thank you. Can I? Can I? Just yes. One last question. How do you find, how, how do you define your tumor bed? Tumor bed. So on the uh, MRI, any gross disease, uh, whether it is the primary tumor or the neural disease is defined as the tumor bed. Okay. So, so a dedicated MRI for planning or, yeah. or you use the diagnostic MRI? No, we use the diagnostic MRI for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Amn. Okay, so while we wait on our judges to um, score the results and give us the final winner, uh, we have a few more uh, awards to give away. The first one is a newly introduced award this year, and that is uh, an award uh, in memory of uh, Begum Mir, uh, who's, she's the mother of uh, Mr. Rahman Mir and uh, Mr. Tahir Mir. Begum Mir um, was a very uh, ardent supporter of Shaukat Khanam Memorial Trust. Um, and uh, his son uh, has always supported us in whenever there is a need and whenever we've approached him. So um, we also have a building in uh, Shaukat Khanam Lahore uh, in uh, Begum Mir's memory, and that is dedicated to the nursing. And um, we have uh, nursing teaching going on there regularly. Uh, we also have a bachelor's program that is now going on. So um, I would like to play a video uh, by uh, Mr. Rahman Mir. And I would also like to invite Mr. Tahir Mir uh, to please come on stage, uh, who's come here and joined us with his family today um, while we launch this new award. And uh, I would request him to come on the stage to give away this award. Uh, in the meanwhile, if we can play the video, please, from Mr. Rahman. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abu Rahman Mir, and we are delighted to introduce the Begum Mir Research Award for the best nursing paper presented during the 21st Shaukat Hanum Cancer Symposium. My mother, late Begum Mir, had a strong conviction to provide free health care wherever possible. She was a great lady that the underprivileged should be provided necessary care free of cost. So Allah be with you all and my congratulation to whoever, whoever wins this award. Thank you very much. Okay, um, 
So you heard the message from Mr. Rahman Mir, the son of uh, Ms. Begum Mir, and uh, this is Ms. Begum Mir on your screen. And uh, the winner uh, of uh, this first Begum Mir Memorial Nursing Award is uh, Dr. Uh, is Ms. Sana Bukhari. Uh, she's from Shifa College of Nursing in Islamabad, and her. And she presented on the role and experiences of oncology nurses in breaking the bad news to patients and their families in selected public and private hospitals in Pakistan. So Ms. Sana Bukhari. Okay, our next uh, award is something that was uh, introduced last year, and this is Bashir Alavi Award. And this award uh, has been uh, co-founded by Dr. Humayu Bashir, who also was a consultant with us, and he's currently um, based in um, Kent and Canterbury Hospital in UK, and he's a consultant in nuclear medicine along with uh, Professor Abbas Alavi. Um, who's a well, very well renowned uh, physician scientist and a professor of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania in USA. He was also a plenary speaker at one of our symposiums a couple of years back, which was also chaired by Dr. Humayu Bashir. And it is my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Mrs. Ijaz Bashir, who's the father of uh, Dr. Humayu Bashir. Um, and in his memory is Dr. Humayu Bashir has actually dedicated this award. So please welcome Mrs. Ijaz Bashir. And uh, the winner of uh, this year's Bashir Alavi Award is uh, Dr. Usama Tariq and on, uh, actually Dr. Amir Faisal. Yeah. Dr. Amir Faisal and on his behalf, Ms., um, Dr. Usama Tariq is here to receive it from Lahore University of Management Sciences. And this is CCT 245718, a dual FLIT3 Aurora A inhibitor uh, overcomes Okay, D835Y mediated resistance to FLT3 inhibitors in acute myeloid leukemia cells. Assalamu alaikum. I am very thankful for this mafil ki jinno ne mujhe jahan madhu kiya aur khas kar Mr. Alavi ki jinno ne apna naam is award ko dekar isko motbar bana diya. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jaz Bashir. Okay, now we have uh, some more awards to give away. And uh, let me just sort out the results here. Okay, those, so the first of the categories that we're going to give out is for best oral presentations. And uh, to give away this award, if I could request uh, if Dr. Paris is here. Dr. One of the judges, no, oh, he's out. Okay, then I would request uh, Dr. Amir Ali Sayed to please come on the stage and give away the award.
So there are um, four awards. Okay, so the first award is for Dr. Hassan Ahmed, who's from Shabrat Khanam Memorial Cancer Hospital in Lahore, Pakistan. And this is for his oral presentation on enhanced recovery program after pancreatic surgery, SKMCH experience, Dr. Hassan. Okay, so the next award is for the best oral presentation again by Dr. Maida Muzaffar, Shagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital in Lahore, Pakistan. And her presentation was on frequency of vertebral fractures by vertebral fracture assessment in postmenopausal women undergoing dual energy X-ray absorptiometry scans. Dr. Maida. And the uh, next one is for Dr. Noor Muhammad from Shagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Lahore. And uh, his presentation was on prevalence of FANCM germline variants in BRCA1 to negative breast cancer and or ovarian cancer patients from Pakistan. And the next one is again for the best oral presentations and that's for Dr. Sayed Mohsen Raza, Shabda uh, Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Lahore. Clinical outcomes of chemo radiotherapy using VMAT for locally advanced esophageal cancer, a single institution experience. Congratulations. Next one is for the best uh, e-video presentation, and that is, the first one is Dr. Muhammad Bilal, Department of Surgical Oncology at Chagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital, Lahore. Analysis of survival outcome for primary osteosarcoma in children and adolescents, a 10-year experience. Okay, it seems we don't have uh, Dr. Bilal here. Uh, next one is again for best e-poster presentation, and that's for Dr. Sabah Tabassum, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Dow University of Health Sciences in Karachi, Pakistan. Sequence polymorphism and expressional changes in CMIC and partner proteins in oral squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, final one for the e-posters is Dr. Hafiz Muhammad Rahman from University of Punjab in Lahore, Pakistan, in silico analysis of a novel interleukin 24 NBD fusion peptide against breast cancer. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Amir. Now I would request Dr. Shahid Khatak to please come on stage to give away the next category of awards and that's for best video presentation. So the first one is laparoscopic Whipple's operation, Shagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Peshawar. And the presentation was by Dr. Neelman. Next is uh, Dr. Shayan Khalid Ghalu from Shagat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Lahore, Pakistan. Excision of carotid body tumor.
Thank you, Dr. Shahid. Okay, and I would request now Dr. Sajid Mushtaq to please come on stage and give away the last award in this category. Uh, that is for Dr. Junaid Azad from Shokat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Lahore, Pakistan. Three state each of projected. Okay, so the moment is here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would like to request uh, Mr. Mansoor to please uh, come on stage uh, to give away the Essen Rashid Memorial Medal Award. Mr. Mansoor, Mr. Mansoor is uh, uh, Mr. Essen Rashid's son, and uh, please. So, um, okay. <laughs> So should I just announce the winner or should I announce from back up? All right, can we do that? Yeah. Yes, we can, okay. All right, so first start with number three and that is Dr. Asad Masood, comparison of efficacy of celiac plexus neurolysis versus celiac plexus neurolysis plus radiofrequency ablation for cancer associated upper abdominal pain. Okay, and then number two is Dr. Amna Manavar. Those escalation and preoperative chemo radiation with volumetric modulated R therapy, simultaneous integrated boost in rectal cancer. And before I announce the result and the winner, I would request Dr. Asit Parvez to please also come on stage. All right, and the winner is Dr. Sundas Bilal, Department of Internal Medicine, Fellow in Gastroenterology, Risk of Tumor Seeding in Percutaneous Endoscopic Gastrostomy and Error Digestive Tumors, a Single Central Experience. Thank you so much. Um, I think everybody who was nominated is a winner. And I know for a fact, if my father was here, um, he would have uh, considered all of you guys winner. Um, congratulations, Dr. Sundas. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And this concludes this session. Thank you very much for attending and uh, congratulations. And everyone did a great job. And thank you to the organizers. Uh, especially uh, Dr. Asad Parvez, the chair, Dr. Kashif Sajjad, co-chair, Anika and her team for doing a fabulous job with this symposium. Thank you all and see you next year, inshallah.